Let be sure to let everybody know I'm recording. Everybody, I'm recording. Where'd you go? Okay. There we are. I got all kinds of stuff on here. <laughs> cool. Okay. Neurodevelopmental disorders. First up. Now again, we're now we're getting into particular cases. Woo so they're set off a few different ways. Uh, Mike categorize them into. Um, yeah, get my little thing here. Laser pointer. Yeah, you know, mood and anxiety disorders, disruptive imp impulse control, neurodevelopmental disorders. Okay, which is um, I kind of expand this chapter and uh, a little bit more than what the uh, DSM five has in your textbook, just to kind of get them all in. Um, elimination disorders, child abuse, and neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, formerly known as fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, it's not called that anymore. So, particular mood and anxiety disorders that happen in children, separation anxiety, other anxiety and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. The DMDD, by the way, is new to the DSM-5. Just sort of an interesting sidebar as to how diagnoses get made. Um, what happened is uh, there's a lot of kids who are getting diagnosed as uh, bipolar disorder. But when people start looking at, you know, why was so many kids being diagnosed this, they realize that, no, there, there's something different out there. This is a different thing. Uh, and by uh, getting together with all the you know, uh, data and professionals and expertise, they came up with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So it's kind of cool how uh, that's uh, science at its best. I, don't know, I, I got my two hats up here if necessary. So well, let's see. Make sure that I get this. Here we are. I want to make sure I have the chat over here. So separation anxiety disorder. Developmentally inappropriate and excessive fear and anxiety concerning separation from those to individuals is attached. It and happens it's a lot it, in toddlers. In I'm sorry? It happens a lot in infants and toddlers and if you have a healthy relationship with your child, it happens a lot. Yeah, there's uh, there's one difference though um, that I I'll point out. Uh, let me see. This is actually is under anxiety disorders. Uh, the difference is the word uh, inappropriate, uh, and what that means is that with toddlers, I'm, I'm going to turn into the actual thing here. Hold on one moment. Um, Uh, there's going to be separation anxiety. Okay, there's a separation anxiety is uh, there's also just uh, that's normal. That's normal. The thing with separation anxiety disorder is it's very much not normal. Okay, uh, a person with excessive anxiety regarding separation of people and places uh, should not be confused with separation anxiety and normal of a normal stage of development. You know, so stranger anxiety. Stranger anxiety is uh, uh, pretty common. Defined, uh, let's see, inappropriate excessive fear, anxiety. It's not really selective for children anymore, uh, but generally that's what people think about it with, with children. Uh, it is normal for, uh, if, I'm, if I'm understanding your cor question correctly, yes, it is normal uh, for uh, toddlers. And it has to be excessive. And that's, what is inappropriate and excessive? What is that? Uh, what is that? Well, that's clinical, right? That's where you as the treating person will say, yeah, this is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot. Uh, and it often presents like school phobia. Well, I think I might have like almost more of a personal example. Um, uh, when I was like first entering like kindergarten and all that, you know, deep fear and all that, but I would also kind of like swear and cuss out some of the teachers when we like the first couple of days because I just really didn't want to be there. Yeah. So I don't know if that counts as like the more severe part or if that's more, you know, the regular child, you know, child development part. Yeah. And that's uh, 
I mean, it's a little hard to know for yourself, uh, kind of going back and trying to diagnose that. But, uh, you know, but you know, maybe again, the if they have the criteria, and so it's something that can follow into adulthood. Yeah, it can. Yep, it can. Um, generally, it's seen with kids, uh, but technically, go into adulthood. That's correct. Um, actually, before I move on. This is just kind of an overview. Uh, what this means uh, for these little bullets and sub bullet points uh, is that kids can get those two. Uh, they can have those two. In fact, OCD often appears in childhood and generalized anxiety is that's excessive worry often appears in childhood. So my point is that these there those don't suddenly appear at uh, you know as a, in a early adulthood. Uh, that people you know, people who do worry will often say, "I've worried all my life." You know, they worried since they were a kid and had OCD since they were a kid. So you know, those can happen in childhood too. That's my main point. Let's see. Um, uh, so can you use antidepressants in children? Yeah. <laughs> um, Depends this is on where, the severity. What's that? Depends on the severity. Like if a child has been abused or neglected or parents are drug users or alcohol alcoholics or something like that they have mental disorders um we had therapists growing up because both my parents were drug addicts and alcoholics and both were very abusive so they had me and my sisters on a lot of antidepressants to help yeah. us transition well that's did it, did it help <laughs> um it did with me my two younger sisters i'm not so sure about okay <laughs> <laughs> um I'm looking up the disruptive. I'm making sure I, I follow along here. This is what I do. Um, mm, page this on. There we are. No, I'm not going to worry about it. So anyway, uh, the, the answer to this question is basically yes you can yes you can but uh you want to know what you're doing <laughs> and this is where uh, i hope that where you know some people can really do that well uh, and others um, less so but anyway yes they can be <laughs> so i'm not finding this right offhand i'm not going to worry about it it's just making me kind of crazy trying to find it it's under mood disorders i'm pretty sure um 155 but for whatever reason i'm not turning to it and it's trying to bug me so i'm not going to i'm not going to Focus on it. <laughs> so, um, so severe and recurrent anger tantrums manifest verbally. These kids are just kind of pissed off all the time. Okay, anger tantrums. You know, they just kind of pissed off all the time. Um, and they uh, mood between temper outbursts is per per persistently irritable. So they're just kind of irritable and, and they get mood outbursts, so, you know, anger outbursts. Has to be 12 months or longer duration, of course. And this one's important. It has to be made between ages eight, uh, six and 18, but they have to be present before age 10. My that that is the reason for that is younger kids can be kind of pills, right? They can be <laughs> kind of disruptive uh, just on their own. So has to be made between those two. And the symptoms have to be before 10. And now, again, you have to separate this out. And this is where it becomes, you know, a diagnostic issue, uh, separated out from uh, an adolescent who has disruptive mood and just irritable all the time because he or she's depressed or he or she's on drugs or whatever it might be. You know, so that's where you know, that's the differential diagnosis. That's a mood disorder. Can some of those um, disorders in children be cured without medications, like just yeah. with? talking with them and working absolutely. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yes yes they can <laughs> so um i put the no, I, I put this in there uh, because they can be used uh, again they're not magic bullets they certainly can be helpful and it depends on which one you're talking about i mean if you're talking about um, a bipolar disorder in kids and, and you can make that diagnosis okay you may have bipolar disorder in kids uh, it's it's kind of harder to treat that one with just psychotherapy, um, but some of these other ones, have, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders, it's its own section as well. 
So <clears throat> opposition defiant, they just argue all the time. OK, there's argue, 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 but they too can lose their temper. But it's just more arguing and annoying. That's different uh, between them and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, whereas they, uh, they'll lose their temperature, but it's not sort of an explosion of anger. OK, so these can get kind of kind of subtle, right? They can kind of subtle, but you can uh, you can have them. They're, they're more annoying. Uh, they're more projecting. It's your fault. Uh, they're touchy, uh, resentful, and vindictive. Uh, well, they, this, they're always out there, kind of pissed off at everybody, uh, and and annoying. Okay, they're they're annoying. Uh, they refuse to do rules. Right? You know, so, the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder are always just kind of angry and get really angry. This one is just they're defying rules. They're blaming others. They're just kind of irritating. You know, they're just uh, that's the difference. It's, but again, it's, it's subtle. Husbands don't count in this, correct? <laughs> I'll let that go. <laughs> Actually, only wives do. It's a weird thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm queuing on songs now. So, <laughs> so, yeah. If people know the song Crazy Women. Is it by Carrie Underwood? I think it's Carrie Underwood. Crazy Women, ex-wives and old good or an old girlfriend. Two black Cadillacs. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, that one's a great song. But uh, anyway, <laughs> so I'm going to stop now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> crazy women uh, uh, weren't made were made by crazy men. That's the uh, idea. So, <laughs> so these are some sort of features. They're not necessarily diagnostic features, but they're things you can just notice. They're always arguing with their parents. And <laughs> so I knew here's a good example. And I knew a kid who had opposition defiant disorder. And I, you know, kind of gave that diagnosis. I, I think you have opposition to find disorder, and, and she said, "No, I don't." <laughs> so, <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, arguing with parents, they don't clean their rooms. Curfews, no way. Generally, peers in preschool years, um, rarely later. Cause, so this happens pretty early on. Um, and here's some ones that you have to that we'll get into. Proceed conduct disorder. So you can have both. Oppositional defiant and conduct disorder. And conduct disorder is an attitude more. It's just an attitude of I don't care. I don't, I don't care about you. Um, so that's 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 bad actually. <laughs> that's bad if those go together. And they can get more mood and anxiety disorders. The treatment it can um, can be uh, co-occur with ADHD. Okay, co with ADHD. Um, disruptive mood dysregulator, uh, dysregulation disorder. And here's one of the way to differentiate that. They lose their temperature, or temperature, their temper less often. You know, I'm sort of obsessed with temperature these days with all the stuff going on. <laughs> so the, 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 the temper averse are less extreme. And here you go. Now, speaking of medications or lack thereof, uh, individual and family counseling It's mainly psychotherapy. If they have other, th other things, ADHD say, mood disorders say, then you treat those, of course, and teach parents how to manage it, reduce uh, in school programs. Here's intermittent explosive disorder. And these aren't angry in between. And this is where some of these get pretty subtle, uh, but that's, those are the differences. Um, so verbal aggression, behavioral outbursts due to inability to control aggressive impulses. So it's not planned. Okay, it's not planned. That's that's a key feature. Is they're they're not planning on attacking somebody. They just wow get upset. Mainly young men with low frustration tolerance. Um, and you can use medications to target impulses, um, uh, impulsive behavior. So maybe helpful. There's a few. Uh, none are approved by the uh, FDA, of course. There's various ones that are used, mood stabilizers, SSRIs, second generation antipsychotics. So those are all uh, tried and used, but mainly it's going to be psychotherapy with this one too, uh, to have an idea of when this they're, they're going to happen. So if, this might be a good place to reiterate a point. Um, when this was coming up with uh, with Brandy last week, um, the, the the question was, you know, how come she has on so many medications? What happened there? And people, you know, for, figured that out. It's lack of communication and whatnot. Uh, but a thing uh, uh, people didn't bring up, and I was going to make a point of it, and it occurred to me with looking at this here now, just now. There's certain there's certain target symptoms that medications can treat. Okay, so um, in, um, aggressiveness, 
kind of impulsivity, kind of, but moods, so depression and anxiety, uh, depression, mania, anxiety, psychoses, um, you know, attentional problems, medications can target those. What often, often happens with uh, uh, people with developmental delay is they're not targeting specific uh, symptoms, they're targeting behaviors. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> and you can't necessarily do that. You have to have the, the symptoms that line up with the uh, underlying neuropharmacology. So if you get that point, you pass the class. <laughs> that plus uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and you're good. So failure to control uh, aggressive impulse, so tantrums, tirades, arguments, <clears throat> all those sort of things that go along with this. Uh, so let me make sure I get the chat here. Nothing. And here, the key one, not premeditated and not explained by other mental illness. So if they have, uh, say, uh, a schizophrenia or something like that as a child and they're having uh, explosive things with that, then the schizophrenia, excuse me, kind of tops it off. I always want to say Trump, but can't do that anymore. <laughs> so next up is uh, conduct disorder. There's a few different kinds of this conduct disorder. So basic rights of others, social norms are violated. And they, they just don't, they don't really care, right? They just say, whatever, I'm just not going to do that. So they're bullying, they're threatening others. They start fights. Yeah, they like just to go beat people up, so they'll start fights. They'll use weapons, physically cruel to people and animals. So they get into knife fights, they hit people with bats. Uh, they steal while confronting victims, they rape. Uh, these, are, these are not nice kids. These are, these are not nice kids. Here's the different ones that they're again are listed in your in your textbook. So those are aggression to people and animals. That's what's that one? Yeah. So aggression, destruction of property. They set fire uh, with the intention of causing damage. So they're not. And this will be different from uh, pyromania. When we get to pyromania, we're on uh, obsessive compulsive ones. Pyromania. They want to set a fire. It's like a, a, a desire. It's an emotional rush. These set fires because they want to burn things up. <laughs> they just want to watch. They want to destroy property, um, and deliberately destroy someone's property. I, a while back, you know, I, th I think they were actually caught. Uh, and uh, probably, you know, I mean, don't hear this in the paper, but there's a, a group of kids that were just going around smashing windows, uh, smashing windows. And I, I believe they were caught. This is however many years ago now. Uh, and I believe they did have uh, ended up having conduct disorder, or at least it sounded like it from the newspaper reports, right? You kind of get the reports and it's like, ah, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> so uh, deceitfulness, they lie, they steal, they lie to obtain goods, uh, they steal stuff, again, with or without confronting a, vic uh, a victim. Serious violations of rules. So stay out late despite prohibition. And this is serious. This is not... Uh, like what I usually say is, you know, you might have a curfew of 11 and you might come in at 1130. Now, this is a, you have a curfew at 11. You come in next Tuesday. You know, it's just like whatever. Uh, you run away from home. You're truant from school. Uh, all these are symptoms of conduct disorder. I have a, um, a thing about conduct disorder. My uncles back in the day, my grandpa was a logger. He's dead now, but um, <laughs> my uncles, my mom's brothers, they would pretend to set fires and set fires in the backyard and they lived in Alaska at the time so everything is covered by forests and trees and all that and my uncle set a forest fire Oops. and back then my grandpa hit for his for his treatment he lit lighters under both of their thumbs and burnt the skin off of their thumbs yeah uh, to me I don't think that was the right way to go but ba way back then you know that was the thing to do you know, I, I, this actually the FDA approved uh, treatment for this is you burn off people's thumbs. Um, really? and then it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's not. I'm just making that up. Um, yeah, probably not the best way of treating that. No, I, I would agree. Uh, it's like the um, little sideline here, but uh, uh, people who catch their kids smoking, make them smoke like a whole pack one after another. That totally doesn't work. I mean, the idea is you sort of classically condition them to throw up with cigarettes, but really what it does is get them more addicted to nicotine. You know, so. So that's, that's not what my mom did to us kids growing up when we were like 11 and 12. Me and my sisters found my mom's cigarettes and um, I haven't had a cigarette in two years, but my sisters are both still smoking. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> Here's a, a few. I, 
Yep, I'm sorry, Dr. Munn, I have a question as well. Um, so as you're going through conduct disorder, um, it's sounding kind of a lot like when people talk about psychopathy. Uh -huh. um, is it is that sort of like a just a, another name or is it a different diagnosis um, or so, is there a difference with like having to do more with empathy or lack thereof? Yeah, good question. Um, sociopathy and psychopathy. Sociopathy is more of a destruction and just sort of a social level, whereas psychopathy is usually more individual. Okay, it's more individual pathology, you know, people who torture individuals as opposed to, you know, break the law. Uh, conduct disorder is more sociopathy. Uh, and this, this is the, the clinical term for juvenile delinquent. Okay, so the, uh, the, uh, the legal term would be juvenile delinquent. But yeah, this is essentially what we're talking about. Um, these, this is more of the psychiatric mental health cl uh, classification for those. Uh, then, you know, so, uh, psychopathy and sociopathy aren't mental health diagnoses, uh, but they are, they are things uh, and they would match up with these. That's correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Here's some different categorizations. Your textbook has a better one. The uh, third will have ADHD, so overt, destructive, non-destructive. These are sort of subcategories of uh, conduct disorder. But here, uh, where is the, uh, yeah, childhood onset type. This is on page 382. I actually found this one. <laughs> it's embarrassing. So childhood onset, uh, one symptom before age 10. Adult onset is after 10. And here's these limited pro-social emotions, lack of remorse or guilt callous, uh, lack of empathy, unconcerned about performance. This is where, you know, they don't really care how well they do in school or football or whatever it might be. They just don't care. And shallow, you know, deficient affect. They just don't have any uh, particular emotions. They don't, they're not necessarily that happy, not necessarily that sad. Um, these are these are bad prognostic signs, okay? Uh, when you have this, it's a uh, sort of, it's a bad prognostic sign for how well these people are going to do overall. I've seen some cool articles actually where they 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 claim that this subset of conduct disorder should be its own thing, its own uh, sort of uh, its own di diagnoses uh, because it's just so much different from the ones that don't have those as far as prognosis and whatnot is concerned. But as of now, no. And then mild, moderate to severe, limited pro-social emotions. This is the idea. Hmm. Okay. So here we are. If you're able to for, um, form, excuse me, relationships, internalize some social norms, become less than them if you're less aggressive, <clears throat> that's a better prognosis. And poor is early onset and greater comorbidity and those limited pro-social uh, emotions. Also concur with ADHD, uh, which is uh, mood and anxiety disorders. So here's, an, here's kind of a good point. Um, with some, like the intermittent explosive disorder, if there's another psychiatric illness that better explains it, then you can't have that diagnosis. In this one, you can have ADHD and mood and anxiety disorders as well as conduct disorder. And that comes down to a matter of, you know, well, a, a bunch of different things, you know, that can, um, the symptom clusters, of course, is one, uh, but also, you know, underlying uh, dynamics, underlying mechanisms of, of action. The, you know, brain chemicals and et cetera. So there's some things that do, you know, exclude others and other uh, and other diagnoses that can have more than one together. You know, they also can have some, uh, specific learning disorders. You know, they might have a dyslexia or a dyscalculia, something of that sort that they have a hard time in school. Now, could it be just a conic disorder, be a reaction to not being able to, uh, um, you know, do well in school? Uh, maybe, <laughs> certainly you want to scream for that. Uh, that's for sure. In here, sorry, um, this is a, your pair, uh, here's the, uh, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, they have Heather in there. So, parent problems, psychosocial factors, genetics, socioeconomic status, community violence. So, if, if there, you live in a violent community, uh, you will have an increased chance of being violent yourself. Um, that's just that's just the way social psych goes, and they were in families to a little to a certain extent. I put in choices at my existentialist side there, uh, because people do 
have a choice in their behavior. They're not doomed to behave this way. And various treatments. So, so if you are saying that um, there's choice in this particular disorder, is it is there um, a biological aspect to it in the brain, or is it yeah. in, that? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't think they listed in here. Due to the, from families, high prevalence of antisocial personality disorder, mood disorders. Uh, so there is a genetic a aspect to it. They don't actually talk about the etiology of uh, this as far as brain chemicals, but I I, I know there are. Um, if I remember right. Yeah, they have lower prefrontal cortical activity. Um, when we get to personality disorders, uh, in order to have antisocial personality disorder, you have to, by definition, have had conduct disorder as a as an adolescent or child. So, I mean, they they basically, if they don't kind of get through this, they become antisocial personality disorders at age eighteen. I, that's their own choice because I think people do have choice. Um, you know those choices can be limited, of course, but uh, but they're never they're never zero. That's, you could argue that, but I don't want to get into philosophy right now. <laughs> um, so there's a few here: child interaction therapy, and, uh, management, of course, relative mild case, uh, up saying highly deviant, highly deviant family, repeated antisocial acts. Then you get into legal, effective parenting skills. Uh, parental management training. So this is uh, they learn how to work with them, how, uh, how to teach, uh, how to work with those behaviors. Foster care, problem solving skills. Can you prevent it by having people get into better families early on? Maybe, yeah, um, maybe. That's nearly, that's not real clear. Uh, certainly, there is that genetic component and consequences. Now here's a nice biopsychosocial uh, juvenile detention centers. Uh, this is so. Um, this is listed in the DSM five. Okay, it's 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 a disorder. It's not a very well treatable disorder, but what can happen is because it's a disorder, when they get into juvenile detention centers, those are packed too, right? Those have too many people, not enough services, etc. Well, then they can send them over to the mental health side and say, well, it's a diagnosis. You know, it's a mental health thing. So let's send them over there as opposed to keeping them in the, uh, in the juvenile detention system. So that's a, that's a biopsychosocial thing to do. Uh, various things to be tried medication-wise. Again, these aren't uh, uh, biopsychosocial. That's right, David. You get the gold star for the day. Um, clonidine 10X, alpha-1 agonists. We, we don't talk about those too much, but... Uh, uh, they can calm these folks down some, and lithium has been used. Nothing particular is better than others, though. It's interesting that we talk about the treatments because um, I was taking a parenting class with Greg Daly. Uh -huh. It's called Cir Circle of Security. And he said there's not a lot of people that attend those anymore. Mm. So he was trying to put the word out there for, so, you know, on the, the treatments, if anybody's interested on Greg Daly's circle of security. It helps with a lot of these conduct disorders. Yeah. Oh, so we've got a couple of people with Greg Daly and circle of security. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's good. Maybe we'll add that to this one too. Because that's a specific thing, right? It's a specific, uh, specific type of psychotherapy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but uh, I know Greg Daly is. I've heard good things about that as well. And Greg's a great guy. I like Greg. So here's some kind of uh, interesting ones. <laughs> the pyromania and kleptomania. So this disruptive impulse control. You can sort of put them under obsessive things too, but uh, they're under disruptive, uh, uh, disruptive ones. So pyromania is they set off, they, they want to see things burn. It's more of this tension and affective arousal as opposed to destroying property uh, as it would be in, in uh, conduct disorder. So they just, they, they're fascinated with fires. And when they set a fire, they feel a certain relief, okay, a certain relief of their of this uh, sort of emotional tension, emotional arousal. Uh, and they don't get mon money from it. Now, people sometimes set fires if, if their main source of income is fighting fires. 
Uh, this happens on occasion. We had, this has happened uh, five, six years ago, I think. I don't know, but yeah, a while back where this guy was setting fires uh, around over in York, actually one over in Priest Pass. Um, so they uh, <laughs> they finally caught him and he'd want to go to the fire. Uh, he, so he, it wasn't pyromania for him. He wanted to get hired on uh, with the fire and get some money out of it. And, but that's that's pyromania. They just like to see things burn. I'm trying to remember that. I'm, I'm getting songs in my mind here today. <laughs> so the roof is on fire. I think it's uh, uh, who just sings the roof is on fire. The roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. It says bad words, though, so I'm not going to take it from there. Uh, recurrent failure to resist impulses to kleptomania. They feel like they need to steal. They don't. <clears throat> they're not getting stuff. Okay, they're not necessarily stealing because they they need to. They're stealing because of this uh, tension. Okay, they have this tension to, to steal, and they get same similar to pyromania. They get the pleasure and relief after committing theft. So it's not to express anger, not psychosis, not vengeance. Get, those are exclusionary. Um, how do you treat it? Uh, again, it's sort of it's kind of hard to treat, really, frankly, just uh, identify co-occurring mental disorders, focus of treatment. They talk about that. Uh, coexisting disorders to reduce uh, fire setting behavior, <clears throat> but there's no real role for med. Uh, family therapy, yeah. Uh, I think, actually, there are studies that look at SSRIs for pyromania. Uh, SSRIs, like Prozac and whatnot, uh, they're good for obsessive compulsive, uh, obsessive behaviors, obsessive compulsive disorder, and these have kind of obsessive compulsive ish to them. Uh, so I'm pretty sure there are you know, studies looking at SSRIs and, and pyromania. That said, uh, it's not unless they're not that good. <laughs> okay. Um, kleptomania, it's, interestingly enough, it's mostly women uh, that have that. I think it's uh, from a evolutionary psychology standpoint, uh, women tend to be the gatherers, whereas men tend to be the hunters. Uh, so maybe they're just gathering. <laughs> so, uh, and SSRIs, naltrexone is an opiate blocker. Comorbid disorders and CBT. So, uh, let's see if you want to say more on those. Yeah, your book says it talks about how kleptomania may, may be more common than what's thought. I wonder if there's uh, there's lots of different things that can be looked at differently now with all the with all the stuff we have available. So I wonder if there's uh, um, more people stealing things, you know, online. You know, things that you can steal online. So would this fall under like what if somebody has an obsession with like dumpster diving or taking things out of trash? That's not and really not hungry? right. Like taking furniture from alleyways that don't belong to anybody or um hmm. there's a hoarding. There might be almost a hoarding. Do they keep these things? Oh, well, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't know. I mean, it might be a disruptive imp impulse control disorder, not otherwise specified. Or not, not otherwise specified. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, compulsive shopping? Yeah, it probably just fit under this just in general. I've never heard of that before. Have a, a sort of a compulsion to dumpster dive. I mean, a lot of people who dumpster dive are hungry. Okay, so that's why they're dump dumpster diving. Uh, but just do it because you have an obsession to do it. I've never actually heard that before. Yeah, yeah it sounds pretty resourceful. <laughs> there you go, Amber. Amber Moon, that's right. Pretty resourceful. Um, you know, I see people gathering things. Yeah, I, mean, well, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not going to figure that question out. <laughs> if you want to have that be a stump the chump, go for it. Um, so... Um, Compulsive shopping and internet gaming disorder. These are pretty interesting. Um, internet addiction they have in the textbook. Um, this is a and people who get on the internet gaming disorders are on are doing gaming all the time. It can be like really disruptive. It's mainly mainly men, uh, but the uh, but there's gamers and that's different. This is people who game, you know, 20 hours a day. Uh, it's just uh, becomes an obsessive disorder. Okay. So how are we doing on that? Doing good. Okay. <laughs> um, 
this is going to be some interesting psychosocial ones. Actually, this is a your textbook. I've already said how cool it is, uh, but they talk about how assessing a child you know, is different than assessing adults. You, know, you have to, you know, who is the patient? Is it the parents? Is it the child? Um, you know, I have to have those kind of uh, ideas. Where are they developmentally? You know, is it developmentally appropriate for them to be anxious for separation, for example? Is it that's appropriate for a two-year-old? Is it appropriate for a 10-year-old? Those kind of ideas. You know, so it's the role of the parent and ways that you assess a child are, are going to be different. And so those are uh, 89, page 89 has that you know, listed out pretty nicely. So if you do get a kid to, uh, to assess, turn to that page again. Uh, applications of norms and criteria. Good sense of what a normal is for a given age. So we already kind of covered that. And you often have to have other people involved, family and, and uh, other significant others as far as like teachers and whatnot. So, so it's a larger group of people to get that diagnosis. Involvement in non-physicians, healthcare treatment. This is uh, probably one critique of this book. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I've been talking about it too much uh, in the in the in the positive way, but one critique uh, is that it, that it is a medical school book, so it doesn't talk about you know the roles of other providers. I put that in there. So the fact that they have non-physicians in the healthcare team here and less so in other places kind of shows that bias. Because uh, really, you want to have non-physicians and all these things, family members and all these things. You really want to get a, a broad spectrum of, of who gets input. Uh, let's see. Then they have various things you can test for. <clears throat> Excuse me. And physical exam. So. Okay. So what we're going to cover here is ADHD, autism, and then intellectual disability. First step, ADHD. Hmm, kind of probably have this out of order, don't I? That's okay. <laughs> so, attention, hyperactive and impulsive dysregulation. Oh, by the way, attention deficit disorder hasn't existed for a long time. ADD, it's always ADHD. And the reason for that is the iterator reliability, meaning ADD was not ever agreed upon very well between uh, patients and, and, and diagnosticians, so they got rid of the ADD and just have ADHD. So, um, inattention, six or more of the following ones. Failing to give close attention to details, difficulty sustaining attention and, and tasks and play activities, does not listen, doesn't seem to listen, uh, does not follow through on instructions or finish things, and difficulty organizing tasks and activities. Dislikes things that have that require attention, like schoolwork, you know, com uh, completing forms, et cetera. Loses stuff, you know, school materials, pencils, books. I, I think coats. You know, kids who lose coats uh, tend to have an ADHD kind of feel to them. Various distracted and forgetful of, of doing things. Just, you know, so those are the inattention symptoms. And the uh, hyperactivity ones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hyperactivity and impulsivity. Fidgets. Taps in hand and squirms, leaves a seat in situations where they're supposed to stay seated, <clears throat> runs about or climbs, uh, etc. Climbing on your furniture <laughs> um, is kind of a very hyperactive thing to do. Okay, so, an uh, ADHD kid will come to your office and they just start climbing all over everything. Now, it's just a, almost a diagnostic behavior. Unable to play, engage in leisurely activities because they're always on the run, on the go, driven by a motor, talks excessively, blurts out answers. The, Jacob does that, by the way. Uh, waiting turn doesn't do that very well. Jacob doesn't do that. So, so as you're doing, look, looking over the case, those would be the pages you want to look at. 108 and 109, because uh, they'll talk about. You know, you'll see, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> that's what. That's the idea. 108 to 110. And here's some older. I like this picture, so I keep it in there, even though it goes against what I just said. <laughs> so I, I do keep it in there though, because um, I just I think it, it it really shows it nicely. Because uh, this is the prefrontal cortex, right, where you have to uh, uh, for focusing. And red means um, the, the the different anxiety, uh, different levels. So the changes in the EEG, etiology: dopamine and norepinephrine. 
this is when you're going to want to have the smoking, you know, smoking while pregnant. Um, women who smoke while pregnant, they, uh, their, their kids have a higher level of uh, ADHD, higher rate of it. So risk factors include uh, parental problems as uh, maternal smoking, substance abuse, you know, obstetrical complications, malnutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So they have all this on, uh, again, once again, in your, in your textbook. Uh, SpongeBob, <laughs> this is kind of a, just a fun, I just keep it in there because I, I think it's fun. They had a study where they had uh, three groups of children. Uh, one uh, watched, uh, one played with like toys. Uh, one watched uh, Blue's Clues, which is a kind of a cerebral cartoon. <clears throat> and one group watched SpongeBob. And sure enough, as you, uh, you know, watch Sp SpongeBob, uh, people just got, th those kids got really hyperactive af afterwards. So I don't know, it, does, it probably doesn't cause ADHD, just, but it's kind of funny that study. I hate SpongeBob. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's very irritating. Um, so, so going back to here, there's various genetics, of course. It does run in families to some degree. Dopamine transport gene. That's the one that brings dopamine back into the cell, the reuptake, and then reduces the size of uh, prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia, and, and cerebellum. Now, go back. Go back to uh, a couple of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have the uh, etiologies, what causes these in the brain function. Basal ganglia and cerebellum are part of motor. Right, the basal ganglia sort of gets you to move. Cerebellum has you balance. Prefrontal cortex is part of the attentional system. So when you think about this, of course, they have the part, the parts of the brain that code for the symptoms are the parts of the brain you know, that aren't as uh, that aren't normally functioning. Hence the abnormal psychology. So again, lining these up makes it's like, well, of course, what else would it be? Hypoperfusion. They have less blood flow going to them. So, and when you do your write up, you do the write up on Jacob, put those in there. All kinds of treatment for it. What's that? Did you see that um, it, it blocks dopamine transmitters? Which one's that? For the, the last slide. Oh, this one here? Dopamine transporter gene? Yeah. Yeah, no, it doesn't block it. Um, this is the this is a protein that's in that's in the neuron. It's in the last the uh, terminal of the axon. Remember, because you have the neuron cell body, then the axon, and they got the synapse between the axon and the dendrite and receptor. But those neurotransmitters have to be brought back up into the cell, brought back up into the cell, and that's the thing where the transporter is, is abnormal. Okay, that's the. Uh, Let's see, let me see if they actually say. <clears throat> yeah, so one study of mutations in the dopamine transporter gene. It doesn't say what the mutation is. It's both 55 with ADHD as opposed to 8 with controls. It doesn't specifically say what that um, uh, what that mutation is, but it's this is the protein that transports dopamine from the synaptic space back up into the uh, into the axon. Um, what do you think? Is this the time for my my uh, board? Yes. <laughs> OK. Can you get it set up? I should have set up beforehand. My, my goal with this, just as I'm transporting this over, my, my own dopamine transporter here, and i got to take this off. My goal with this is to, uh, uh, come here. Just to make this a little bit more realistic, a little bit more classroom type. Uh, so how am I? Trying to see if I, if you pin me, I was told that if you pin me, that that, let's see, that it shows up better. Mm, what am I doing here? Are people seeing the whiteboard? Yeah. Not, How do you pin somebody? Um, if you left click. My my screen's being funky here. It's not getting up to where I want it to do. Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. 
So if you go to the three dots, see, is that where I went? Actually, I'm not seeing it now. <clears throat> well, this isn't very helpful, is it? Oh God, it's the meta call. It's the what? It's a meta call because we're we're on the call and we can see the call and yeah. how do I do I have any control over this whatsoever? <laughs> can everybody hear me? Yeah. So it's the students that have to pin you. So if the students go onto your screen and click on the three dots on him personally and then click pin, it will make him bigger and you will be able to see him a lot better. There you go. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. Welcome. So that's working. All right, so dopamine. <laughs> This is a, I'll see if I can explain this here. That's, yeah, that's close enough. That's close enough. Come on. So get the neurons, right? The little axons. See that okay? This will be very short. So, and over here, another neuron down the road. That's working. <laughs> I think a lot of it has to do with the colors. So we're going to make uh, dopamine blue. Still okay? Looks like it's still working. So dopamine gets released, goes across, and hits the receptors. Right? This is kind of the this is what what happens. But it gets reuptook. I well, was called a transport protein. So it's a dopamine transport protein. I'm going to try one more thing quickly here. No, it didn't make any difference. So well, um, trying to figure out how to do the, the lights things. It's not, not working quite yet. So that's the transport protein. Now, it's in that one that they have these mutations. So this is a protein, right? It's a protein that kind of grabs a neurotransmitter and brings it back up into the, into the axon to be used again. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd have to look up what those abnormalities are in the protein uh, within that transporter, but that's where they're talking. So it doesn't really block protein uh, dopamine. It's not blocking it. It's just this abnormality in how it's brought back up into it. Does that make sense? More questions? Cool. Okay. Feel like it's you're getting a pretty good idea of my my office. Bring you into my home. Oh, here we go. If you hold down, oh there, and Annalise is saying how to do that. Specific person image gives you option of pinning it. So do you have to unpin me now? I have a map by the semesters in. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get there. It's improved a lot, I think. Certainly improved a lot since uh, spring. <laughs> it's like a disaster. <laughs> so I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. All right, so let's go back to uh, sharing here. All right. OK, so we're good. So it's hard to go back and forth here. I wish I wish you could split screens with this thing. I don't know if you can. Uh, but treatments, there's various medications. Uh, stimulants are the course of the uh, sort of the first line. People give Ritalin uh, or Adderall. Adderall is uh, it's a uh, amphetamine. It's not methamphetamine. It's amphetamine. Uh, and then there's one called uh, dexedrine, which is uh, it's the it dex is the spinning. By the way, that's what that is. So Adderall is a mix of uh, um, amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. So that's actually probably something to point out. Molecules will spin kind of like a spiral staircase. 
some will spin right. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, right, and others will spin left. So when they spin right, they're dextro. When they spin left, they're levo. What will happen is, so levo amphetamine, dextro amphetamine. What will happen for a drug company is they can isolate one of those. They first will put out the medication that has both dextro and levo. Uh, but then if they isolate the one that's actually active, so I'll say, you know, um, the levo is the one that's actually active, they now have a new drug and they get a new patent on it. Uh, so it's kind of a clever way of extending your uh, extending your patent on medications. Um, uh, Ritalin is just one preparation of methylphenidate. There's a bunch of them out there. And there's things that make them last longer, act shorter. So there's all kinds of different stuff like that. Uh, Stratera is right. indicated for ADHD. It acts on norepinephrine. It blocks norepinephrine uh, and uh, dopamine reuptake. So, so again, kind of put this together, right? That's what I want you all to do. Start putting this thing together. So you can look at the underlying neurochemical activity, norepinephrine and dopamine. Look at the particular parts of the brain it goes to, prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia. What are, those, what are the activities of those parts of the brain? Attention and movement, okay? And how are you treating that neurochemically? Well, you now have things that act on norepinephrine and dopamine in the prefrontal cortex and the basal ganglia. <laughs> so, is vitamins the same thing, or is that in a different class? Say again, I'm sorry? Is Vyvanse the same kind of thing, or is it a different class? Uh, yeah, it's, it's actually in there. Vyvanse is another, uh, it's a, it's in a class, it's, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor as well. So the basal ganglia, is that involved in movement? Right. What is the prefrontal cortex involved in again? Attention. And a bunch of other stuff, executive planning, but uh, definitely attention in what we're talking about here. And cerebellum, what is that involved in? Uh, movement. Oh, movements as well. Uh huh. Yeah, movements. Have to take bio psych. <laughs> um, movements really complex to kind of do this is like stupid amount of neuroactivity. <laughs> so I have to, uh, but so this is good because it'll kind of give the kind of a basis of neuroactivity. I'm going to scoot back so I can show you know, be a little bit broader spectrum here, if, if you will. Um, I, I'm not getting any bigger, though, for you. You still have this, this the, uh, screen on, uh, on front of you. So, but I'll just do it in my little box. So movement, I have to decide, prefrontal cortex, decide that I want to move my arm. Okay. It goes into the supplemental motor cortex and some of these other parts. So it goes back from here, back to the actual motor cortex. From that part of the cortex, it goes down to the basal ganglia. Okay. The substantia nigra also gets involved in that, goes to the basal ganglia, through the thalamus and down, and pretty quick, I move my hand. My cerebellum is in there, so I can move my hand from here to here, as opposed to not being able to move it in a coordinated fashion. Now, so to go from, you know, I want to move my hand from here to here, it takes prefrontal cortex, Supplemental motor cortex, premotor cortex, motor cortex, <laughs> the uh, uh, the uh, caudate putamen and globus pallidus to the thalamus, <laughs> substantia nigra allowing the first two to go, uh, the uh, cerebellum coordinating it all down to the spinal cord, thalamus in the spinal cord, uh, getting to the red nucleus, by the way, uh, and gets down into the branches of my uh, various axillary neurons and whatnot, and my damn hand does that. <laughs> so that's that's all it takes to go to that. So it's like, it's like stupid complex uh, just to say I want I want to move my arm. So I have a I have a question real quick. Uh -huh. um, I have ADHD and I'm like I found out that one of the only things that works I've tried stimulants, I've tried all that stuff, um, but I found the only one of the only things that helps me really focus is having like movement. So I'm on an exercise bike right now. Yeah, and it just helps me actually focus. Why? Why does doing something else like that, like, is that one of the only things that can really do it for me? <clears throat> I, so that I might have that. I don't think I have it in here. Um, well, you're basically occupying part of your brain that would be the 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 H, okay, the hyperactivity part, um, and so you're you're using that 
otherwise, being on a, on a, a bicycle now, stationary bicycle, uh, that'll, that'll kind of get the H. So you'll, instead of having the hyperactivity, all those parts of the brain that I just listed off, you know, just kind of being hyper, uh, you're focusing them on something that you can, you can just do. And it's, you don't really have to focus on riding the stationary bike. You're just riding it, right? So you're getting all those parts of the brain that are involved uh, with the ADHD and focusing them on something that you can just do. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> um, that'd be under behavioral, actually. I should expand that uh, behavioral. Uh, but you know, there's things. Uh, well, for school settings, you get extra time on your tests. Uh, decreased uh, distractions, all that kind of stuff will be um, how to treat ADHD. And EEG biofeedback, this, this is pretty interesting. Uh, but basically, you know, because you have these differences in the prefrontal cortex here, right? That's their, their, the activity is less in the prefrontal cortex. And you have this little biofeedback. This is, you probably get this for phones. Never even, I wonder if you can get it for phones, probably. What can't you get for phones now, right? Um, and have that, uh, uh, doing that biofeedback, you unconsciously change these brain waves to ones that are, are more uh, more attentive, if you will, uh, for folks who do not have ADHD. Yeah. There are a few people in town that do bio, uh, EEG biofeedback. So there's some side effects of the of the stimulants, and you know, as people pointed out, these don't work for everybody. There are certainly treatment options and you want to have all the treatment options sort of available to you uh, but you have to you know you can't just say gosh it's this or that it's just this one thing because it just doesn't work that way mm -hmm. let's see so adults and adults seeking stimulants so um so this is a this is some caution they throw in there if you have adderall uh, everybody will get a, more focused on amphetamine OK, so you, in a little bit of amphetamine, everybody does a little bit better on a little bit of amphetamine, but uh, people will abuse it. This is a problem in college, not Helena College, of course, but every other college in the country uh, will have this as a problem. Uh, hopefully not here, by the way, um, but you, you will focus more. Uh, so people will, I, I took a course at uh, MSU just because I could take a course at MSU. And it's pretty funny, it was a movie course and these students behind me. Uh, we're talking about how they're just taking each other's Adderall. <laughs> it's like, I almost turned around and said, it's really being pretty stupid people, but uh, I didn't do that. Uh, but yeah, they're talking about how they get uh, each other's Adderall to help them focus in school. You can get buzzed, okay? People will try to seek these medications because you can get buzzed off them, especially high doses. Uh, and you get, if you get a lot of them, you're increasing dopamine, right? All the four dopamine pathways. You're now increasing dopamine <clears throat> in the mesolimbic system mesocortical, mesolimbic, nigrostriatal, hypo, uh, hypothalamic, pituitary. Um, because you're increasing it there, you can get psychoses. And this is where people with meth get their, get their psychoses as it goes through the mesolimbic. Um, so <clears throat> you'll have a, in, in, most of you, know, I'm, I don't know how many of you, some of you going into nursing, some into social works, uh, but some of you might go into uh, be a nurse who prescribes meds or go to medical school and prescribe meds. I think some of you have that idea, uh, which is cool. You'll have uh, you'll have people coming in and they'll go, uh, I'll get back to the uh, symptoms here. So they might come in and say, um, I've had since um, uh, since before of age of 10, I've have I've had trouble uh, paying close attention to details, difficulty sustaining attention to tasks, and I often seem not to listen, and I, I seem like I'm always on the go. They essentially list off the DSM uh, criteria for ADHD, and they'll say, and I need uh, Adderall, 20 milligrams, four times a day. <laughs> it's like, uh, well, um, no, really. Um, how about if we start off with uh, uh, antidepressants like Wellbutrin or Effexor? They treat it too, just as well as Adderall. Uh, so that'll take you probably eight weeks to have that, you know, see if it works or not. If that doesn't work, we'll go to Satira. Uh, it might take another mm, eight to ten weeks to see if that works. And, you know, we'll keep going through these. And maybe eventually you'll have Adderall. You know, they, they, they don't come back. <laughs> like, Next doctor, please. <laughs> How are we doing here? Yep, we're, we're a minute overdue. Let me, uh, this is a good place to stop. Okay, hello. Go away. Okay, so I'm stopping sharing now. All right. 
Um, so let me go ahead and no, how come this? This is not being shown. I just stopped sharing, right? Yeah. Get back to Teams. There we go. That's what I want. So I'm curious if people think, yeah, let me stop. Why is this not going up for me? Mm -hmm. There we, go. It's there we go. There we go. The team, teams gets kind of funky, it seems to me, that there's a, like certain, you get in these certain situations. I'm going to stop recording.